Hey guys, welcome to week 10 in Opportunity Management. Um, today we're going to be learning about Frog's Leap Winery, which is a case study that we're going to be working on for the next three weeks. So I want to introduce this case study to you. And what I'm going to do is just go right here where it says Lecture Case Study. Okay, as you guys know, we can always go into um, the whole module for the week by going into Modules. Right, and as we click through this, we learn about everything that we're doing for the week. So right now, what I want to do is jump into the case study and give you guys the lecture. Okay, so jumping into it, there's a couple of things for you to work with. One is we have the actual case study, which is right here. Okay, and you can click on that and that's going to open. All right, and we want to be reading this very carefully. Okay, I'm going to be going over this with you, showing you my notes page which is actually right here, okay? Professor Sten's case study notes, which are right here. And I'm gonna go over that because my handwriting is always interesting. And we have our case study workbook, okay? And that's right here. And we're gonna be going over this as well because this is a new workbook. This will be our first time using it, okay? And we'll be using this for the next three weeks. Um, to get started with our case study workbook, okay, and this case study was created by Armand Galinsky, and it was offered through um, Harvard University. And what I want you to do is to get started, think about what do you already know about sustainable development and social entrepreneurship. And at this point, you guys should probably know quite a bit, right? So take a, a write down of what it is that you know, and then what do you want to know, okay? What else do you want to know, especially in relationship to the California wine industry? Okay, so this is something new. So sustainable development, social entrepreneurship might not be new, but now the wine industry is. So what do you know and what do you want to know? Okay, just a quick reminder of the reading process strategies, and I'm supporting you in this. Um, we have the before reading, which is what I'm doing now. Okay, we're going to go over my, my notes pages, and that's going to help us with the before reading. It's going to give us a review, kind of get us engaged, um, and create that context for learning, okay? Then you guys are in charge of the during reading, right? You guys are in charge of going through and making your own notes pages, summarizing, taking notes, using stickies, highlighting things in different colors, okay? So that's your job because we really need to know this case study well. And then the after reading is what we're doing in this workbook. OK, where we're going to be creating um, more context out of the material that we've read. OK, there's three parts to what we're going to be doing. OK, part one is key topics. OK, and with this one, we're going to be looking at um, different terms. <clears throat> OK, so the idea of so corporate social responsibility. Some of these terms we're familiar with, but we haven't specifically studied it. Okay, so this is going to give us a chance to really look at this a little bit more closely. Um, and what is a corporate um, social responsibility strategy and what's the outcome? And then since you guys do know a lot about this, I'm giving you space to come up with another strategy that maybe they haven't mentioned and the outcome of that. Okay. Um, and then we're looking at environmental management systems, which we haven't studied at all. And those are really cool because they're developed by the U.S. government, Environmental Protection Agency, the EPS. And it's a way to make sure that you're creating sustainable methods of land use and management, often associated with agriculture. Okay, so you guys get to learn more about this, and it's going to be in your case study. Okay, the EMS. And then a big thing that we're going to be looking at, which I really like, is the resource-based view, the RBV. And it's a model that sees resources as being the key to having a superior firm performing. So firm is another term that we use for business or company or organization. Okay. And we're going to be learning about this different way of looking at a business and looking at how do we assess the value that that business is bringing and how is that business competing in a highly competitive market and what does their green philosophy and ethics and principles really mean when we're looking at sustainability and we're looking at sustainability in can this business last forever, 
or can this business last or can it grow or can it grow at a rate that's going to be able to, you know, keep it viable? Um, sometimes businesses grow too fast and they crash and burn, or sometimes they don't grow fast enough and they get gobbled up by co competition, right? How do you have that balance? And we're going to learn more about some of these vocabulary terms, tangible resources, you know, things that are actually there, like the Landmark College campus, and then intangible resources, which are things that you can't really measure. Um, that would be sort of the Landmark College professors, if we're going to be doing a um, RBV of Landmark College, for example. Okay, so we're going to be learning about this a bit more. It's in our reading. Okay, in the case study, and we'll have a chance to go in and look at this um, a little further to look at that they produced. Okay, so we have something um heterogeneous resources, which are things that um, that um, that people have that others don't. Right, it's kind of giving us that competitive advantage because you're able to do something a little bit different. Okay. Um, if you didn't have heterogeneous resources, if you had homogeneous resources, homogeneous means the same, then you would be competing in a way that you're just doing the same thing as somebody else. Okay. Heterogeneous re resources is saying you're doing things differently. You have some kind of competitive advantage. And that's something that we're always looking for in businesses, right? How can we dominate a market segment, whether it's eco-ethical you know, organic, local, we still need to be competitive. We still need to have a market associated with that. And then we have something called immobile resources. And that's um, resources that don't really move from company to company very easily, right? And it might be the person's brand. It might be the, um, the culture, the intellectual property, again, um, like the knowledge from the teachers if we're at Landmark College. Okay, those are resources that aren't easy to transfer one from one place to another. Um, so when we're going through this resource-based view, um, we're also, another part of it is called the Vero attributes, okay? And what we look at is that, again, is are we able to sustain this competitive advantage, right? Because the financial resource-based view analysis that gives us a chance to kind of understand how are things working in this company to give me this competitive advantage. But once I see is something tangible or intangible, heterogeneous or immobile, and we're going to have all of that, right? So we have resources that are all of these, but they all, this is a flow chart. So they all have to lead down. They all kind of, um, oh, and filter down to a Vero resource, okay? So yes, you have tangible, intangible, heterogeneous, and mobile on how are they Vero, okay? And then once you get through the Vero, then we can see how is that actually a competitive advantage, okay? So this structure is giving us a way, it's a flow chart, giving us a way to kind of look at businesses in a new light to kind of assess and see where do we have strengths and weaknesses, where, how are they flowing towards this idea of a competitive advantage, which also is linked to sustainability. So if we're going down here, we're looking at what kind of things do resources exhibit, okay? So a resource is something that a firm is using to make something out of. So if we're looking at Badger, we might be looking at their beeswax, right? Or their olive oil that they're using in their products. So if we're looking at Vermont Quince, we're looking at Quince, right? In this case, we're looking at wine in a vineyard, okay? And we want to know, is their resource valuable, right? Is it helping the organization to increase the value offered to its customers, okay? If it's not, then you have a competitive disadvantage, right? You're probably not going to get very far, okay? But if it is, then we're wondering, well, is it a rare resource? Is it something that only a few companies have access to? You know, is your sunscreen, this eco-ethical sunscreen that many other companies have not developed yet, okay? If it is, then how much does it cost to imitate, right? Is it something that companies are going to be able to create really quickly themselves, okay? If it is, then we want to know, well, what's the organize, how organized is the organization to capture the value? Are they ready to go and, and sell this immediately, okay? Um, 
and then that gives us the sustained competitive advantage. So to go through it again, if we go down this yes, 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 right? I'm using a valuable resource that not a lot of people have access to. It's really hard for them to make it. Um, I have a good organization. I'm right here, ready to go. I have a sustained competitive advantage, okay? Anytime I don't, okay, then I end up in this place here, okay? I have, maybe I have a competitive disadvantage. Maybe I have competitive parity, right? So here we have Coke and Pepsi, right? It's the same product. It's not rare at all. Okay, so that's going to give me, that's not giving me a sustained competitive advantage, right? I have to come up with some other way to be competitive, okay? Coke versus Pepsi. Um, let's say my product is easy to imitate, okay? Maybe for the minute I might be benefiting because I have, you know, first come as advantage. But if it's something that everybody else can do too, then I need to really up my ante on my game right? How am I going to maintain that competitive advantage as everybody else starts copying what I've just done, okay? Or change my process so it can't be copied. And then the last thing when we're looking at the organization to capture value, okay? Again, if I'm not capturing value with what I'm doing, if I'm making this great eco-ethical organic thing that nobody knows about or cares about, Okay, I might have a temporary competitive advantage because of the novelty of what I've just done. But if I can't sustain it, if I'm not organized and I can't continue to build and capture on that, then it's just going to go away. Okay, so that's where we're looking at the importance of strategic management and marketing and production and those processes, right? We've seen that with Badger, how their processes are so exact and how they make all of their products and the testing and um, you know, very, very well thought out. And with quince also, we see that with the recipes, right? Things are very scientific, okay? And we have this idea of strategic management and production. So Vero, okay, is dynamic and changing. And Vero stands for, um, oh, valuable, rare, imitate, and organized. Okay, so it's kind of the acronym of those four words, valuable, rare, imitate, organized. Okay, so Vero is dynamic and changing, right? As the industry changes, as different companies and organizations come in, um, what might be a sustained competitive advantage at one moment can change. Okay, so this is good to know. Okay, this model in particular, I've spent a little bit of time on because it really is something that we need to wrap our heads around that's new. And it's a really great way of looking at businesses. Okay, I'm just going to go back here and just make sure I didn't go over these other things too lightly. No, I think you guys are good with those. If you get stuck with anything, just totally let me know. Okay, and here I want you to explain Frog's Leap sustained competitive advantage using this model. Okay, and we're going to learn about that in our case study. Um, good. All right, and then key topic four is intergenerational equity. So these four key topics are what we're going to be looking at this week. Okay, so as we're reading through this case study, this week we're going to learn the case study backwards and forwards. Okay, and we're going to be looking at how can we apply it in these four key topic areas. Okay, so intergenerational equity, that's something newer for us too. And that talks about the resources and assets that don't belong to any generation, but are managed and preserved in trust for all future generations. So it's kind of like when you're looking at the triple bottom line, people, planet, price, right? It's that planet part of it. Um, so in economics, this is known as the commons. Okay, and the commons is... is you know, that place, that natural environment, what are you leaving for future generations? Okay. And so we're going to be thinking about this as we're looking at Frog's Leap. Um, where are they thinking about intergenerational equity? Where are they thinking about the future, not just in five years or 10 years, but maybe 20 years? Right? Where is their winery going to be as an organization? But where is the planet going to be? What is their um, positive impact on the earth? And we heard Badger talking about that a lot too, right? Wanting to know how can they show the positive impact that they're having in the long term, okay? So those are the four areas that we're going to be looking at as we're reading today, looking at the, the intergenerational equity, 
looking at the financial and resource-based analysis, the environmental management systems, which they specifically talk about in the, um, in the case study, and then the corporate social responsibility, um, which is implied in a lot of the organizations that um, Frog's Leap is associated with. Okay, so that's what we're focusing on this week. Just so you know, coming up next week, we're going to be doing something more specific. We're going to be using some videos and really looking more detailed at the organization itself. For now, what we want to be doing is getting our general overview picture. Okay, I'm just kind of scrolling through so you see what's coming up next. Um, and then we're going to be applying, how do we evaluate what they're doing? We're going to be bringing in our sustainability lens and looking at this, okay? And doing our business model canvas and the sustainability lens and, and providing your own expertise and being able to look at an organization from this perspective. This is not in the case study, but this is something I'm offering to the professor um, for him to add to the case study because it's going to be a really cool way to also look at what's happening with Frog's Leap. Um, okay, so don't worry so much about these things right now because these are coming up. This is actually in three weeks. You'll be doing a SWOT analysis of everything. Um, and then the last thing that you guys are going to be doing is creating a sustainability action plan for Frog's Leap. Okay, but it's not going to be such a huge thing. Right now it sounds really huge. Oh my goodness, how would I do that? But by the time you get up to this, it's going to be three weeks from now. This is going to be pretty um, standard, right? You'll already have a really good idea of what it is that you want to be doing. Okay, and you get to brainstorm their plan. We're going to do short-term, mid-term, long-term, and then you get to write um, a presentation on it. Cool. And that's it. And this is just for us. Okay. So this is Frog's Leap from 2011. So this is a case study that we're using only in the classroom. We're not going to be contacting the client. Instead, we're using this as a way to learn ourselves. Okay. But then once everything's all said and done, we'll go and like, see, well, what is Frog's Creek actually now in 2020? But right now we're not doing that yet. So far, so good. So that's our workbook. Okay, what I want to do now is introduce the case study. Okay, so let's go back here. Okay, and we're going to go to my notes. Okay, so the case study you guys can read on your own. I'm going to go through my notes and, and some of the areas I've highlighted and what I'm pulling out of here so that you can also understand it better because my notes might not be very clear. Okay, so far so good. All right, so here we have the case study. All right, so when we read the case study, we want to kind of flip through the whole thing first and then kind of go back and look at it again. So here we have our introduction. John Williams is our main character. He is the founder and CEO of Frog Sleep's Winery. And here it says he came to Napa Valley 27 years ago with 40 bucks in his pocket, sold his motorcycle for five grand and started a winery which is now $22 million in debt. <laughs> Sounds like the beginning of a horror story, right? But it's actually a very interesting story. Um, you might be surprised to know that a lot of today's really big successful companies also carry a lot of debt. And as long as they can manage the debt, as long as they can make the payments back on the loans that they've taken for their own development and growth and still also pull a profit, then they're going to be able to continue as a business. OK, um, here we have a quote in order to make a small fortune, you're going to need to start out with a large one. And that's kind of the modus operandi in the winery business. Right. Wineries are usually expensive, but John came and did it differently. OK, we have a little backstory on him um, talking about how he got started in. Um, in winemaking, OK, um, 1999. Um, till 2011, there was a time of change, right, for these Nap Napa Valley wineries, okay? And they were using viral marketing, developing wine clubs, shifting distribution channels, okay? And we're going to go look a little bit more at that period of change, right? Um, 
And here we have um, John Williams doing things a little bit differently. Okay. He started out as a, um, a student at Cornell University and fell into winemaking as part of an internship that he did and then ended up going back and doing a master's degree in winemaking as well. Okay. He developed the industry's most sophisticated environmental management system. Okay. That's EMS. We're going to learn more about that. And then we're going to find out how did Frog's Leap um, really survive in this highly competitive, very difficult world of winemaking and do it in a different way. Okay. And here I'm looking at um, their competitive advantage. Okay. Right there, that EMS. Okay. That's something that's unique about them. And then exhibit one, okay, which is important too. We're going to go look at these exhibits that has a lot of the, the numbers and the backstories in it. Some of my notes, this says, what does this tell about the founder, his values and personality, right? That someone would kind of jump in in this sort of maverick way and boom, start a business. Um, it also talks a lot about his personal relationship, okay? And the fact that um, businesses are doing direct sales, on-site sales, clubs, those are things that had changed in the wine industry. So I was kind of flagging that. Um here we have, if we were to break this into sections, here we have an introduction to the wine industry, right? Not all of us know what the wine industry is. And I have the positives and the negatives. So the positive is it's well known. Okay. Everybody knows Napa Valley, California wines and it has good conditions, right? That's why they're so well known. There's good growing conditions. Okay. So there he is. He's part of the Napa Valley, California wine community. It's a well-known community. It grows good wine. Okay. The negative to that is the exact same thing. It's a well-known community that grows good wine. Lots of competition. Okay. How do you differentiate? There's my word there. How does he make himself not be that dime a dozen? Okay. So this is kind of interesting too. Since 1999, the pre number of premium wineries, because he's a premium winery. We're going to learn about that. His wines cost more than 20 bucks a bottle. Um, since 1999, this industry has grown from 329 wineries to 1,250. Huge. Okay. 92% of these, almost all of them are boutique wineries. So they're small companies. Um, producing less than 50,000 cases a year of wine. So that's how we define a small company. Okay. So let's see what else. Then we have mid-sized wineries doing their own growth. Okay. And then we have an economic downturn. Okay. Remember this case comes from 2011, right before this from 2008 to 2009, there was a global economic downturn. And ironically, wines, expensive wines actually did pretty good. Okay. So here's my big question. Why would expensive wines do better in a global economic downturn? I have an arrow here. Okay. There's my evidence, right? Double digit growth. So here's my little table too, my premium wine industry. And I'm showing the last 52 weeks, right? This is from 09 to 10, 2009, 2010. At 52 weeks, that's a year. Okay. So my dollar share. Okay. My price segment. So my wines that cost more than 20 bucks. Okay. The value percentage change. It went from 11.4. Okay. And then even more recently, 11.8 growth. Okay. This is a growth. So more people are buying expensive wines. Okay. Here's my cheap wines. They went down. I have less sales. Okay. Total one, I'm looking at four and a half percent growth. This is really pulling that growth forward, right? That over the $20 price. Here I have my cheap wines, three to $5 or three to six, you know, six to nine. These categories are falling, right? I'm having less sales in this area and this area is growing. That's crazy. Okay. Well, maybe because they're expensive, but also if we look at volume. Okay. So the volume of sales is also increasing. So it's not just, I'm charging more for my bottles. It's I'm selling more bottles as well. Okay. So on both areas. So why would that happen? I'll give you a clue. When you're broke and you can't afford the fancy dinners and beautiful lifestyle you used to have, 
you can at least feel good having a good bottle of wine once in a while. And that's what people ended up doing. Um, higher priced wine, you know, spending 20 bucks on a bottle of wine was a lot less than spending 120 bucks on a good dinner. Okay. So yeah, there was an economic downturn, but people still wanted to feel good about something. And a nice bottle of wine was actually more affordable. Okay. Um, so what else do we have here? Going on to the next page, number two, okay, we have how the U.S. is dominating wine consumption. And before we go there, let's go look at tables one and two, because that's really important. So I'm going to scroll all the way down to the bottom, okay? And here we have tables one and two, okay? Lots of scribbles on here. Look, there's my sticky note. Okay, so John is a student winemaker. This is the story. Okay, starts in 1884. Okay, boom, <laughs> there was some wine being being made somewhere. And then 1972, here comes John Williams. Okay, a student at Cornell did an internship at a wine company. Loved it. Okay. Um, and look at the time frame here, too, because this is important as we're looking at entrepreneurism and opportunity development. This winery did not develop overnight. He was a student. So think about this, you guys, in your own journey. Eight years later, it took him eight years before he became um, a head winemaker in the industry. And then another year before he actually became the, the entrepreneur. So first he was a student for eight years. He was an employee for one year and then he was an entrepreneur. Okay. So in that period of time, he's able to build his skills, his management, his strategy and learn from others. So he did a student internship. He went back, he became an employee and then he became an entrepreneur. And he also spent four years, even while he was at entrepreneur, he wasn't working full-time at his own winery. He was still working at someone else's winery. He didn't start working full-time until 1985. So for four years, he was with a day job before he became a full-time employer of his own company. So that's important to think of too, because a lot of times we see people starting companies and we think, boom, that's just how it happens. And it doesn't, okay? It's a gradual process. It's very organic, okay? Um, what else did I put out here? So here we have this period of expansion, right? He gets married. Him and his wife are working on this winery together. Um, and then 1994 to 1995, they buy another winery. Okay, so now they're expanding. Um, 2005 is when they put in their first solar system. Okay, that's pretty cool. We had a divorce in here too, but I think they stayed friends. Um, and then 2006, we had a LEED certified building built. And LEED is a, um, a way of building things that's eco and sustainable and generates energy like our STEM building is a LEED certified building. Okay. So that's where we're starting to see that $22 million in debt. Okay. Because they've invested into a lot of eco-friendly um, practices. Okay, which actually when we go into the case study, we see it's actually a good decision and it's paying off by the energy that it's creating. They also here in 2009 created a marketing club, the Fellowship of the Frog, okay, which is a whole new area of sales, very, very innovative. In this period of time here, 1993, 2002, um, he's creating new wines. He's doing a lot of product innovation, okay? So all of this is, is telling me the backstory, how this business got to where it is. Exhibit two is talking about the California sustainable, um, I have to look because my sticky note is right on top of it, the sustainable wine growing program, okay, SWP. This is also key, all right? And to understand this in the context of the business model canvas, we can see here we have key activities, okay? So what it, what this is, it's the Wine Institute and the California Association of Wine Growers partnered to develop this sustainable wine growing program in 2002, right? Remember, remember we're talking about um, our competitive advantage. We're looking at extreme growth in the Napa Valley wineries. Well, how can these wineries compete, all right? And what they did was they band together and they created this thing called the Sustainable Wine Growing Program. And collectively, they promoted that together 
to be able to build more of a market niche for themselves and a more of a competitive advantage. So they were working together, many, many wineries, okay, so they could all benefit. So the key activities that we have is high standards, self-governance, education, right? Working with neighbors, communities, and other stakeholders to make sure that they have this open dialogue, okay? Those are all key partners. They're not part of Frog's Leap, but collectively they're all helping Frog's Leap, okay? We have a vision um, where we're looking at, at sustaining the community for future generations, right? So that goes back to that question in the workbook um, where we were looking at the intergenerational equity, okay? That's where you see it right there in the SWP. Um, we have the three E's of sustainability they're talking about right here where it's environmentally sound, it's socially equitable, and it's economically feasible, Okay, so that's really important when we're looking at our intergenerational equity. Okay, those three E's of sustainability. And what does this say? John's, here I am reading my own handwriting. Um, let's see. John's annual conferences. Okay, John's annual conferences. So John was, was one of the big leaders in developing this SWP, and his own winery would, co would um, sponsor conferences every single year, host conferences for this. So when they first started, okay, there was 813 wineries um, participating. By 2009, there was 1,237, okay? Okay. Um, and then we're looking at um, wineries who are, who are um, um, by size, whatever. What is this? Before the economic, after the economic. Okay, so just different data about the different kinds of members. But this was really interesting as 2004 was before the economic downturn and 2009 was after the economic downturn. Okay, and what's important here is the growth that they experienced during these hard times economically. Okay, so originally there was 128 organizations, now there's 329. Okay, total cases produced. We have 62% um, of, of 240 million cases total statewide. What, what is this category? I was just, just explaining how it is. 59% of all the ones owned by the organization. So anyway, we're seeing growth. Okay, this is the bottom line. We're seeing growth in this despite the entire industry having bad economic times. Okay, and remember only the high-end wines were getting the increased market share during those bad ec economic times. But still we're seeing a lot of expansion in this area of sustainability. Okay. So, and then I have some language here that we're going to learn about in just a minute. And this is very important. Okay. We have this idea of a low husk market, which we're going to learn about in a minute. Boomers, baby boomers, and increased value for premium wines. So those are the three things that really drove the growth for this particular type of approach towards winemaking. What does that mean? So if we go back up here to our case study. And we're looking at consumer segments, okay? So this is now page number 147. This is huge, okay? So first of all, in 2008, the USA dominated the world in the, cons well, USA people dominated um, world consumption of wine, okay? We surpassed both France and Italy, the biggest uh, wine consumers, and now we took this spot, okay? Suddenly, wine consumption was trending, right? People, more and more people were drinking wine and the people who were drinking it were our baby boomers, right? Our boomers, they love wine, okay? So in 2010, uh, wine consumption reached an all-time volume of 2.54 gallons per resident over the age of 21, okay? At the same time, the 25 to 44-year-olds were the largest segment of wine consumers, okay? So now these are the folks who are like, you know, 35 to 55, right? These are our boomers, okay? So the boomers really loved wine. Some other demographics that we got here is who's who's drinking this wine? Well, it's white people, age 25 to 44, okay? Um, is This is our boomer market that's emerging, okay? 
This is our traditional market right here. It still is the dominant market, the 55 plus, 44% of the wine is drunk by them. Um, if we're looking at education, college graduates drink more wine, right, than um, non-college grad graduates. So we're looking at an educated, white, older white um, audience, except the boomers are different, right? And these boomers collectively, even though this is only 13.6 and 16.3, collectively, it's about 30% of the market, okay? So it's different from the traditional market, which is right here. And this is where Frog's Leap came in. Frog's Leap took this new emerging market and leaped with it. Ha, ha, ha. So the health that we have, there's some trends, okay? Again, our boomers, right? They want to be healthy. They want to live forever. Red wine, okay? So red wine was trending as something being healthy. And then we have this thing called Lojas, really came out of California. Lifestyle of health and sustainability. So these are our green consumers. These are our eco-friendly. And back in the 80s, this stuff, and the 90s, this stuff was just coming out, okay? So this was kind of newer. Um, so by 2010, it was pretty established, but it still wasn't a mainstream mindset like it's become now. So you have these low house consumers, they're savvy, sophisticated, ecologically and economically aware. They wanted society to, um, really just be setting that world example of corporate social responsibility, ethical practices, um, so they had very high values, health and fitness, the environment, personal development, sustainable living, social justice. Um, and they were big, right? 38 million people, 17% of the population. Now, if we go look at this again, between the age of 25 and 30, 44, these people are, are just, you know, getting established in their careers or getting established with families and with kids. And so this is a very dynamic section that has a lot of potential growth for a long time, right? These people, you've probably got 60 years of, uh, of um, customer out of this person, right? For their life, stuff, life cycle. So anyway, cool, right? So we get this big market, it's new, it's trending, it's big, and they're eco. And guess what? So is Frog's Leap, okay? So they fit in. They also have some money, right? $209 billion annually um, spending power. And... The younger ones, 14 to 24, were the most concerned about issues such as climate change and environmental protection, okay? And that takes us here to our green consumer table, okay, which is that new market segment. And what's interesting with this, and then we're going to go back to the reading, is that here we have our average age is 40, okay, so a little younger than all consumers. And this isn't just wine. This is the green consumer in general. Um, a little bit more feminine, okay? Again, they're white, but we also have more diversity. Look at that from the average market. A little bit more diversity, which is cool. Um, college educated, okay, and a little bit more wealthy than the average consumer. Okay, so we have this wealthy, educated, diverse, um, ties in with that boomer age, a little more feminine, okay, new market segment, right? Green consumer. Awesome. All right, now we're going into some wine um, information here. Oh, this is the case study. Oh, this is table four is embedded. Got it. Sorry, guys. So now we have the, um, the wine industry. There's some confusion, right? What's organic? Everything's organic. All right. So that could be a positive or a negative. So these, these, you have this uh, market that loves this kind of organic green stuff. It's not clearly defined in wine. Nevertheless, people still like organic wine. Okay, so here we have um, U.S. sales went from 80, reached $80 million in 2006, but then it, it doubled almost to nearly $130 million in 2008. Okay, an increase of 28% over 2004, whatever. So we're seeing growth, okay, growth in this idea of organic. All right, so that's number two. Right, so number two is U.S. dominates consumption, and we have these Lojas boomers. All right, okay. Next, we have the California wine industry. Right, so what exactly is happening in this particular industry? 
So it's a new market segment. Remember, we saw incredible growth. These boutique wineries, they were never there before. Okay, so we had unprecedented and sustained growth from 2002 to 2007. And remember, when we go back to our little model, where's my workbook? Boonk. And I'm going to go back to here, my favorite little model. Okay, remember, we're looking for that competitive advantage. Now, if everybody is starting to grow wine, okay, we want to see how is our wine going to be different from everybody else's, right? We're looking for that competitive advantage. Valuable, rare, okay? So keeping that stuff in mind, let's go back to our story. And we have a time of unprecedented, unprecedented growth, and we need to differentiate, okay? We also need to reduce costs, um, during the downturn. So even though people want to spend more money on wine, we don't want to spend more money producing that wine, right? We still have to think about our own bottom line. So um, we have this hyper-competitive trading environment. People are starting to compete on price, okay? If you're competing on price, then you're going to have um, lose some of your market, remember? Because if you fall into that cheap wine category, you're going to lose your market and your sales, Okay, and a lot of the businesses did do that. It was unusual that Frog's Leap took that, that route to be an expensive wine because intuitively when the economy starts tanking and everyone's losing jobs and, you know, we have our um, housing bubble bursting and everything like that, businesses want to hunker down and meet the needs of the people who are now poor. So they want to make cheaper wines and everyone's competing, trying to have the cheapest, cheapest wine. Um, and they ended up just creating a smaller market for themselves and they were losing. So they're in this culture of scarcity. So in the middle of all that, here we have um, our friend John the Maverick saying, well, I'm just going to make really good expensive wine. What? All right. But that tied, that was a really good move for him. Um, what else? Now we bring in something called the triple bottom line, right? You guys, I think have heard that before. And we're looking at people, planet, and profit, which is price. Okay, and that's a start standard term that people use when they talk about green marketing, green industry, sustainability, corporate social responsibility. They use that triple bottom line language. And that's kind of what preempted the development of B Corp also. B Corp kind of took that and went a little further. But if we take a look at this, we have this California Sustainable Wine Growing Alliance, right? So they're an ally. That's that SWP program. We have 1,237 vineyards participating in this. Okay. Um, what else do we have going on? We already looked at Exhibit 2 where we saw, um, you know, the growth in the numbers and how things were working there. Um, and then exhibit three, we, we learned more about the green wineries. We saw all of that. Um, so we're looking at, what are we looking at? Frog's Leap is being a leader. Okay. Oh, so here we have the, the conference. Remember I had that note about the conference. So they hosted the Sustainable Wine Growers Conference. So Frog Leap was really one of the early adapters, one of the early developers of the Sustainable Wine Growers thing in the first place. Remember that the guy came from Cornell University. It's one of the top agricultural colleges in the, in the U.S. So he, he comes with this idea of sustainability and brings it into the wine industry um, host conferences at his own vineyard every year, started with 10 folks being a member of this. Then they had over 250 wineries um, in, what, five years, okay? So huge growth in, in this concept, okay? So you would think he's creating more competition for himself, but at the same time, he's creating more awareness and education and market for all of those boomers out there. If he wanted to just be sustainable all by himself and be like the lone sustainability guy, he wouldn't have had a loud enough voice to be able to do that. By collaborating with those 250 other wineries, collectively, they all can capture the attention, imagination, and dollars of that market. Excellent. All right. So here we have a great quote um, talking about why, right? So here's Ted Hall. This isn't our guy. This is someone else from a different winery. Um, talking about why he was in that sustainable wine growers um, 
the SWP, okay? And just really looking at the market value of organic farming, right? Hey, I can make more money doing it organically. Let's do it, okay? So sometimes we might think of organic as being really, you know, earth-focused and very value-driven, but the bottom line is we need to make money, okay? That's what's going to keep a sustainable business operating. We had a survey in 2011 of wine producers and found that um, wineries were very aware of sustainability issues um, and a lot of people increased investment in, e in EMS. And going forward, we're going to see more specifically what EMS actually means. Um, so a lot of people are jumping in on this, not because they want to save the world, but just because they see that they can save their pocketbook. Okay, there's demand for this stuff. And hey, you know, it looks good and it helps the earth. Um, it saves money. Everybody's doing it. But then you lose your competitive advantage, right? If everyone's doing EMS, then EMS suddenly doesn't become special. Okay. But the nice thing with EMS is it maintains itself being special because it is about sustainability. And I'll give you a sneak preview. It's about your farming methods. It's about how you're using water, how you're fertilizing your plants, how you're managing your, your soils. So it does um, pay off in the long run too, just by creating a better quality farm. All right, you guys all with me? So we're just about there. Okay, now we're looking at a period of growth. Okay, so we kind of saw the backstory, how it came about. We learned about the wine industry. We learned about our Lojas person. We learned some of the sustainability language. What about growth, right? Because we can't just be a winery. You know, we have to be a growing winery if we're going to be able to continue to compete, but we don't want to grow so much that we outgrow ourselves. So here we have in 1981, Mrs. Frog's Leap was producing 653 cases. By 2010, they were producing 62,000 cases in a year. So how can they do that and still maintain the philosophy, their principles, their sustainability? That's a really big operation, 62,000 cases, okay? They started with a Sauvignon Blanc, all right? And now they're doing mostly red wines, okay? So they've really re evolved a lot over the years. Here's their price points, okay? Most of their wines fall into that higher than $20 retail category, okay? Ties in again with those boomers and the Lojas. It's that new market structure, okay? Again, those Lojas folks love their health benefits of red wines. So these guys are right there, okay? Um, here we have a staff headcount. They grew 100%. So they had 25 employees. Now they have 50 employees, Okay, a lot of their employees are folks working in the field, trimming the plants, um, you know, putting the vines on those wires, you know, just really being farm workers. Okay, um, they also had a tasting room. They have different levels of management that they've developed over the years. So even differentiating their own workforce. Okay, they also purchased 100 acres of vineyards in the surrounding area. So doubling its acreage, that's another way that you can produce your, um, increase your production is by having more land to produce on, okay? So they owned more property. They had more workers. There was, they had more varieties of wine and very high price points, okay? Um, and here we have the two group, the true growth over the years has been the acquisition and planting of vineyards. It reduced their, increased their income, but and reduced, wait, it reduced their income, increased their debt, and added significantly to the operating cost in the short run, right? So in the short term, it cost a lot of money, investing money up front because these vines are not producing wine yet, right? You have to get everything prepped and ready. It's a couple of years before the wine, vines start producing, okay? So again, we have this future vision that we're investing into, so it's a short-term cost and a long-term gain. And you have to balance that if you're going to be a sustainable business. Okay. The company sales grew from 7 million in 1999 to 12 million in 2010. Okay. And that's net. So net cost is after you've taken out the operating cost. So think about if you, you have your fish net in the fish tank, you're going to go pull out the fish. Okay, you use the net, you only get the fish. You don't get all the water that's also in the tank. All right, and that's where you're looking at net sales. So when they say net, they've taken away all the other costs. It's just basically what's left over for your pocket. 
Okay, sort of, because that would be profit. Um, we have something called a three-tier distribution chain, nothing crazy. It just means that you're selling to restaurants, supermarkets, and wine specialists. Okay, so there's a little bit of differentiation in the market, but that's how wine is sold. Um, there's something called resellers, right? So they're also um, supermarkets. Oh, we did all of that. Okay, there is a 60% increase in sales, which is kind of cool. Okay, 80% of the sales, this is Frog's Leap, um, were in the U.S., Okay, but then they also had some sales in Japan and Europe. Um, big thing that they had was the fellowship of the wine club that gave them direct sales so they could sell right to consumers. So they have a 50% markup on their wine. So my $20 bottles of wine are actually costing them $10 to produce. Well, actually, they're selling them wholesale. I'm sorry. They're selling them wholesale for $10. And then the stores are marking them up and selling them for $20. So when they do a direct sale, they're going to be selling at direct sale $20. So they get a lot more money for each individual bottle. They sell direct sale, right, as opposed to wholesale. So they do both, right? Wholesale, they can move more, more product, but they get less per product in, in um, cost and earnings. Direct sales, they're probably going to sell a little less product because it's individual sales, but they make more money on each sale. Good. All oh, right. So Frog's Leap reputation um, began with a good review. Okay. But then they didn't really care. A lot of the other wineries were competing on getting good reviews of their wines and Frog's Leap didn't care. He was more into the land and developing things in an eco-sustainable way. And by the way, yes, his wine was good, but he wasn't competing like the other vineyards. And that's another thing, you know, where you're looking at that competitive advantage where is he creating um, new value that others are not? Okay, and his big thing was fun, right? This guy was a maniac, you know? He just, like, came out of nowhere, bought this winery, you know, sold his motorcycle, boom. He's out there, he's having fun, he's doing things differently, and it's cool, right? And that's starting to get him his own market, okay? It was good timing for him, too, because he could, again, get into that Lojas population, and here I have the business model canvas, right? And I have, how was this developed? His customer relations and the value proposition, right? So talking about this fun. All right, here we have sustainability, okay? So sustainability, this is where he goes into more detail on what that EMS thing is. So we're looking at dry farming, which means no irrigation. So if it's a drought, it's a drought, okay? And if it rains, it rains. A lot of the other wineries were using irrigation, and that would make them very dependent on water. Think about California, there's never any water. It also didn't make for very good wines. Wines, actually, the grapes do good when they're stressed. And um, so dry farming was a better method of farming, and it was actually cheaper, okay, and more sustainable. Organic, okay, so doing a lot with replenishing the soils, using cover crops, using um, compost, that also helps to preserve the water in the soil. So again, minimizes that, you know, helps to keep that dry farming effective. And it's biodynamic. So again, that's the compost and the cover crops. So we're, we're building healthier soils. We have healthier plants, better wine. They don't need to be fumigated and herbicided and all that other stuff because the plants were healthy themselves. The soil was healthy. The workers were being given annual contracts to work, so they were well-trained. A lot of times these wineries will have migrant workers, so they come and go, it's seasonal. But um, Frog Sleep said, no, we're gonna pay these workers full-time for them to stay here year-round, and they ended up with better quality workers. Um, they saved money by composting all their stuff because they didn't have to be buying all those chemicals and fertilizers or paying for stuff to get hauled away. They were able to reuse it themselves. And again, they had that year round employees that they needed to keep busy. So that was an easy way to keep them busy. So we have these values, um, higher quality wine, high, higher quality life, giving back. All right. Because they wanted their employees to have a good life as well. All right. So they're doing the sense of humor and they're just having fun. Okay. They're very mission driven. Um, they're into like energy self-sufficiency. And we already saw that big investment, $1.2 million um, into that solar system. 
Okay, and they have this goal of being energy self-sufficient with geothermal and solar power. Okay, out of that $1.2 million investment, $600,000 was a rebate from the local utility company. So looking at that business model canvas, that cost structure, we got those key partners there helping us out. Okay, and that really made that um, energy advantage um, feasible for Frog's Leap. Okay, so they're, they're spending money up front, but then they don't have a lot of costs. Their operation costs are lower. So they're slowly earning that money back over time. They expect in seven years they would have earned back pretty much everything they invested into their energy system. Um, they're also saving CO2 emissions because they're not driving 4 million miles. What are they talking about here? Um, oh, okay, because everything's being developed and um, processed locally right on their own facility. Okay. Oh, and that's the value of the CO2 emissions that they just created. Okay. It's equivalent to not driving 4 million miles. Um, again, LEED certified building, so leadership in energy and environmental design, that's what LEED means, and that's the fourth step, okay, so there's specific steps here that they're taking to be sustainable. So think about this with your own businesses, right? When we're looking at Badger, they have a, a, a green building, that LEED building. They're also um, interested in investing more into their own energy, right? So as we're learning from other people's sustainability plans, we can be thinking about our own clients and things that maybe we can introduce to them, or even things our own clients are doing that maybe these guys weren't, that we could build into our own plan and recommendations for them, okay? Kind of like Quince was really going out and building a lot of awareness of Quince. You know, maybe that's something that Frog's Leap could do is come up with some rare grapes and really, you know, specialize in that rare grape. We don't see that happening here. Um, da -da 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 -da. So now we have um, good employee protections, human resource practices. Okay. And we're talking more about that full year, full-time employment I was talking about. Um, above industry standards. So they're really treating their work as well, giving them three weeks of vacation, paid health benefits. Um, so they have a very dedicated, efficient, safe, healthy workforce. And that actually results in more innovation, sustainability. People are really dedicated to making this winery the best ever. Cool. All right. Let's see what else we got here. Number six, the future of Frog's Leap. And here we have exhibit six. So let's go take a look at this idea of proof of concept, right? This holistic, sustainable, um, you know, can something like this really happen? Let's go and look at exhibit six. All right. Exhibit six. Where is it? Three, four, five. Oh. Well, exhibit six is in our packet. Let me see. What did I do with that? Maybe it wasn't. Oh, it wasn't that exciting. All right. Let's just go back. Um, yeah, I didn't really get too much out of exhibit six. I think I thought I would have, and I didn't. Um, okay. So last part on the open other end, the future of Frog's Leap. So this is where you guys come in for your final project. All right. So we have this great thing. John's done all this wonderful stuff. Here we are. And the industry's maturing. A lot of people are being eco. John's getting older. Um, you know, this, this winery has been around for a really long time. What happens now? All right. And it's a question. Okay. So here's some humor that they used. Open the other end. Ha ha. And the wine bottle labeling. Um, what does this tell you about John's personality and way of thinking? Here's a quote. How can we continue to grow sales and profits while remaining a small winery production wise? I know that some business people are trained to think outside of the box, but first I want to know where the box is and what is in the box before I even think about what's outside. Okay. One option for sustaining Frog's Leap growth is to pursue other EMS projects, right? And so here we have some options. So one option is to do it again, right? Go do some more EMS, go get some more people involved, go and, you know, keep redoing what you've already done. Um, he says there's more work to do. They can continue to enrich the soil and, you know, just keep doing it more. It took them 10 years to kind of build what they got with their whole sustainability model. 
Um, so what else can they do, right? It's another, throw another 10 years in and do it some more. Another option is to look at the sales end of things, right? What else can he be doing? Well, maybe he can be doing more with the direct sales, right? Maybe he can do more direct sales to consumers. Is that going to take away from his other distribution channels? I don't know, right? But maybe that's something he could do. Or what's another challenge we have? Remember, we got that uh, $22 million worth of debt, right? And he wants his kids to take over this business. He's getting older now. Are they even interested in it? You know, what's going to happen um, in the future? Can that debt be sustained? All right. And it's a big joke, his $22 million debt. And this is a challenge that you guys get to solve. Okay. William's old, oldest son is working for another winery. His middle-aged kid is starting business school. The youngest is getting into law school. And now he's in his mid-50s. And he's wondering, how can I position this business to be successful for the next 10 to 20 years? After which time the transition it to the next generation would begin, right? That's when his kids are going to start taking it over. Um, so there you go. Here's some vocabulary. And then here's those um, exhibits that we had looked at. Cool. This is something also I just want to show you guys. Did we look at this one already? This one we looked at. Exhibit three is really cool. So this is talking about those green wineries. Okay. So here we have three kinds of programs, certified um, green land, certified green winery, and then sustainable practices. Okay. And here's all the wineries, what they're doing. Here's Frog's Leap. This tells us how big they are and also tells us what they're engaged in. So I looked through this, it's two pages and 25% of the wineries were in all three categories, just like Frog's Leap. Okay. So land winery and practices are all sustainable. So out of all these wineries, just a quarter of all the green wineries, 25% of the greenest of the green. Okay. Um, what else did I notice in this? That was good. So here we're looking at, um, the, the green, the certified green winery, the areas that they were working in water, energy, pollution, and waste. Okay. And these are the different methods, what exactly they're doing, right? What does this mean? So they're restoring and protecting and enhancing the watershed, which is water. Okay. A wildlife habitat. So it's not just about growing grapes. It's about improving the environment around them. Okay. And they do that by uh, working with the soil, working with um, natural pest control and the bio region, energy and water. Okay, so they're, they're working with cover crops. Reduced tillage means just not plowing the fields over. Instead, they can just trim or mulch. Um, using organic inputs, erosion control, right? These are the hills of Napa Valley. Habitat management, so hedge grows. That's going to put in more birds and um, places for other little critters to live. And they can eat pests off of the grapevines. Um, also, bird boxes are good for that. Integrated pest management, like having ladybugs eat aphids and stuff like that, so you don't have to be spraying pesticides. Energy conservation, so not using so much energy. Having a weather station, okay, having renewable energy, such as the solar and the biofuels, and creek and river restoration. So, in, in, again, keeping that water um, clean and available. All right, this is the income statement, really important here, okay? So here we can see, I'm looking at 2010. That's really what I'm most interested in. And keep in mind that these are hundreds of, these are thousands. Okay. So here we're looking at gross profit is $7.1 million. Okay. And then we're looking at operating expenses, sales and marketing, general administrative. So we have $4.8 million in operating expenses. And here we have um, the loan payments. Okay. How much he has to pay on his loan. Um, what else? So we have how many cases were sold, um, the sales, and then the cost of goods sold. So cost of goods sold is looking at the labor, the packaging, um, the energy, all of that goes into the cost of the goods sold, the uh, markups, the salaries. Okay. If we look here, we have assets. Okay. So all businesses have assets and they have liabilities. So assets are things that you have um, that are positive. So he has inventory, again, 2010. He has um, 
11 million dollars in inventory he has 1.9 million dollars in accounts receivable that's people who are paying him for stuff they already purchased twenty thousand dollars in cash that's kind of normal um prepaid and other expenses a total current assets of 13.845 million dollars okay so even though he has that 22 dollar 22 million dollar debt he has 13 million dollars in assets okay he also has the value of, of his property um, then we have something called depreciation which is um, loss of value for machines as they get older um, we have net property and plant equipment other assets so total assets 39 million dollars okay that's why a bank took the risk to lend him money because they saw that his assets had value okay and that kind of could be used as a guarantee for the loan um, or just for a voucher that this is a viable business so liabilities and capital okay so notes payable that's um, things that he has to pay out accounts payable and accruals so supplies and suppliers total liabilities is 25 million dollars okay so some of it was that loan debt okay there we have 19 million dollars and some of it's these other liabilities 5.5 million he also has something called shareholder equity which is kind of interesting and that's people who invested into the winery so at one point he must have been offering shares or membership and so people own that and they can cash it in and then he'll have to pay them back some kind of um you know money so they must have they might have made an investment maybe bought like a one thousand dollar share you know with the hope that it'll have value interest value in years to come okay so that's there it's a separate item because it only becomes active if people actually um, um, cash in their their equity sometimes they'll just reinvest it back into the company or they're just happy to not have it right they're not going to go and cash it in they're just going to continue to own um, that investment cool so total liabilities and equity including that is 39 million dollars okay so there's a lot of the behind the scenes stories. How did this business grow? Where does it make its money? How is it making its money? Um, what kind of um, things are helping it to differentiate? Again, going in here and looking at this particular model. Okay. So that's what we're going to be doing now. It's just kind of going over that, putting it into these different areas of, um, of topics and seeing where it goes from there if i go here to my canvas whew, you can take a breath we finished our lecture i just want to real quick um show you some of the other things that are tied into this um a weekly team meeting that we're going to have tomorrow make sure that you're ready we're going to be doing it a little bit differently you guys get to talk about something that's been of value that you've learned so far and tell us how you're doing ask and ask a question to our next student okay and then so we're all going to be kind of sharing together in our conversation tomorrow and then we're going to get into some of the nitty-gritty of the work and any questions you might have from that um, going ahead I'm going to go to the next page of our module and we're going to be done in like five minutes I'm just quickly going through the module for you guys um, Okay, there's the case study, which we already went through, and you'll see my video there. Next piece is your homework. All right, page one to six in your workbook. Read the case study very well. Um, here's our discussion. Okay, so now you guys get to think about where do you see similarities with what the clients and companies you're working with are to the winery, right? These are all businesses working in sustainability. Where do you see things similar? Where do you see things different? Come up with two things similar, two things different, and share these. Okay, so you reply. This is our um, discussion. So you would reply. I would say, you know, Vermont Quince is similar, blah, 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 blah. Okay, and then you can also write how is it different. You each have to respond to at least two other posts by your classmates. Okay. So make sure you do that all by Friday. Okay, you do post reply. If you want to attach something, you can attach something. That's not required. Cool. 
All right, next we have um, current events. So this is going to be different. This is going to be a discussion this time. And um, who's doing our current event? It's Mackenzie. So Mackenzie's doing our current event. I'm asking you guys to go to Fast Company because they got really cool current events there. This is all about what's happening in management. Okay, big thing, Corbett 19. So what's going on? Find a current event from that. Talk about um, it. Okay, so what? this is Mackenzie's work, and each of you will have a chance to do this. So find the article, um, post it on the discussion board. I want you to upload it because sometimes we don't always have links that are going to work. And then um, introduce it, tell us why it's important, and ask three questions. So that's Mackenzie's job. You guys have the job of doing the discussion. So once she's posted the article here, oh, there she already did it. Okay, thank you. All right, now you guys can go and respond back. Okay, she wasn't able to save it as a PDF, but it looks like we could probably just catch it from what she's done. Let's go take a peek and see if we got it. Boom. All right, how to stay virtually connected on your own terms. Cool. All right, this is kind of fun. Um, and Mackenzie or anybody, just so you know, I'm going to go control print on this. And then I'm going to say save as PDF. Okay, I'm going to say save. And then I can save that to my desktop. I go save. And it'll do that. Okay, so and then I can go and attach that to this particular piece. Cool. Maybe I'll do that right now. Reply. Let me see if I can attach. Oh, no. I'll, maybe I'll do it here on the bottom. Reply. And I'll just attach it. Okay. So I'm going to go to my desktop. I'm going to find how to stay digitally connected. Okay. And I'm just going to say connect um, attached file. Cool. So you guys can do this yourself in the future. All right, and it's saving it. Okay, and there it is. Cool. All right, next thing that we have is our participation survey. That's the last thing. So just make sure you covered all your tracks, got everything done. This counts as attendance. I have everything due on Friday. Cool. Awesome. All right, so you guys did it. Um, let's go back here to our home page and yes. Okay. And this is where we are. Awesome. We'll have a wonderful time working on all of this. I'll see you guys on Tuesday. If you want to schedule time to meet with me on Thursday to go over anything, that's always available as well. Awesome. All right. Take care.